Welcome back to another video. Of course, my name is Gareth from Park Cameras, as it always is, every single week. And you're absolutely right. It's a dirty Tuesday. Welcome back to Tutorial Tuesday, where each and every week, each and every Tuesday, we bring you a brand new fresh photography tutorial. Now this week, we're going to talk about macro wildlife photography. We've talked about wildlife photography a few times in Tutorial Tuesday. We've even talked about macro photography a couple of times, maybe once actually, on Tutorial Tuesday. And today, we're going to combine it because it's a really interesting thing to go and photograph. Now, macro photography in general, I think, is fascinating. It always feels to me when I do it, there are an infinite number of things to photograph. Everything becomes really interesting when viewed up extremely close. It just makes everything come alive and, and, and see things in a completely different way. You know, similar to things like a time lapse or long exposure, where you just get a completely different vantage point on the world around us, and I love it. So, we're gonna talk specifically about how to photograph the macro wildlife kind of things. Now, this includes things like insects, you know, bugs, small creatures that you could photograph like that, but I even like to include things like plant life and certain interesting plants that are small and I think kind of loosely fall under the umbrella of macro wildlife. And it also gives you a few more subjects to go and shoot. Things like mushrooms, but even things like grapes, things like that. They can be really interesting when viewed up close with the macro lens. So we're gonna talk about the things you need to make this happen. We're gonna talk about lighting. We're gonna talk about settings. We're gonna talk about how to find your subject. Let's get into it. So first of all, before we go any further, let's talk about the kind of kit that you're gonna to need to make this happen. Now, essentially you're gonna need a camera and a macro lens. Now I was using the Canon R6 and then the Canon RF 100mm macro lens. And essentially a macro lens is a lens that allows you to get in nice and close to your subject. It has a very, very close, close focusing distance. So you can get in very close, magnify that subject and actually capture it full size or bigger on the sensor. That's essentially what macro photography is. So a macro lens is a must because it's gonna allow you to get in extremely close to your subject. But something that I've really thought about with macro photography is full frame is Great, we all love full frame. But with macro in particular, APS-C might actually make your life a little bit easier because it's a bit of a crop sensor. So it's already actually zooming in a little bit, essentially. You also will have a little bit more leeway when it comes to the depth of field. And that can be something that is important with macro photography. So I would imagine something like the Canon R7 would actually be fantastic for this kind of photography. But either way, I was using the R6, so you'll need a camera, you'll need a lens, and in an ideal world, I generally like to bring some kind of tripod. Now, I don't always bring my biggest, heaviest tripod, which I tend to use for these videos. For a macro shoot, I'll often bring a tabletop tripod, something like that, because I don't need something massive. I just need something that can stabilize my camera if I'm using a longer shutter speed. So, before we get onto that, though, the settings and the lighting, Let's talk about how to find a subject. Now, this is probably easier than it might initially sound. They are actually everywhere. You know, whether you're looking for bees, ants, you know, flies, butterflies, there's all kinds of things that you can photograph and you don't have to go too far to find them. Unlike with sort of general wildlife, deer, birds, stuff like that, where you might need to go to, let's say, a lake or a forest and traipse around a bit and look for them. This is much, much easier. They mostly can be found in your garden, and if not, they can be found at a local park, a pond, a lake, in the hills, wherever it is that you might have around you that you could go to. I'm very lucky, I have lots of places near where I live that I can go to to photograph things like that. You know, we've got the South Downs, I've got a little nature park around the corner from where I am, and my first port of call is always my garden. Now, if you are gonna go exploring and maybe walk around a forest or something like that, and you wanna look for interesting creepy crawlies to photograph, the easiest way that I've found to do this is just to slow everything down. Make your walking slower and really take in the environment around you. This is gonna have two effects. First of all, you can look for signs of movement, whether that be on the ground, whether it be in the air. It's gonna be easier to spot something moving which is probably gonna be something that you can photograph. It also means that you're less likely to immediately scare off things like butterflies or, or something that might react to the noise and the speed of your movements. If you're moving slower, you're generally gonna notice more things 
and scare away fewer things. So once you slow yourself down, you find creatures, whether it be snails, bees, whatever it might be, you can then go into how are you gonna photograph them. And there's a couple of things we're gonna talk about now. Lighting and your settings. Now, lighting is an interesting one. You could either bring something like an off-camera flash or a continuous light that's gonna make your life a little bit easier, to be honest, on how to light these creatures, or you can go down the natural light route. Now, I tend to go down the natural light route just because it's a little bit easier for me in terms of how much to carry, and I tend to be a solo shooter, so it means that I don't have to hold a camera with one hand and then hold an off-camera flash over here and stuff like that, so I tend to go natural light. That does have its advantages and disadvantages, and there's a couple of things to look out for if you're gonna go down that route. The first is what is the weather like? Now, a day like today, it's very overcast, it's gray, that could actually be fantastic. Essentially, that acts like a massive softbox in the sky. So you get really nice diffused light, the contrast is lowered, which is kind of helpful for a lot of this kind of photography, and it looks good. It makes these things look good. You don't necessarily want really high contrast. The downside is, it's not quite as bright as if it is direct, super strong sunlight that we've had recently, which of course means that you're gonna have to figure out how to expose correctly given those situations. Now, if it is very bright sun, that can be great for your exposure, but I sometimes look for slightly shaded areas that I can go to to try and take a photo, just because it's gonna be slightly nicer in terms of that harsh sunlight and the harsh contrast and shadows. So how are we gonna use our settings or what do we need to think about? Well, depth of field is gonna be a big part of this. When you're using something like a 100 mil f2.8, it's gonna give you a shallow depth of field at the best of times, but especially if you're getting in very close to your subject, it is gonna get very, very shallow very, very fast, and you're gonna have an extremely shallow or narrow focal plane to work with. You wanna make sure your focus point is on kind of the head or the eyes of the creature that you're photographing, but you definitely might wanna consider stopping down that aperture. That's gonna allow you to have a deeper depth of field which is gonna ultimately result in a better photograph, but it also gives you a little bit more leeway in terms of focusing. You don't wanna have just the front in focus and everything immediately start to blur out behind. It just doesn't look very good. And it kind of looks like we weren't thinking about the depth of field when we took the photo. So we might wanna stop down. Now, I generally won't go any faster with my aperture than F4. That's about as fast as I'll go. And I'll experiment with F5.6, F8, maybe even F11, maybe even I'll stop down further from there depending on what I'm photographing. But of course the downside of this is I'm now letting in less light onto that sensor. So there's a couple of ways we can combat this. First of all, this is where the tripod comes in. If it's a slow moving or basically a stationary subject, we can pop the camera on the tripod and we can use a nice slow shutter speed to let more light in and combat the stopped down aperture without having to bump up the ISO. Alternatively, we can bump up that ISO. It's not too much of an issue with newer cameras like the R6, the R7, things like that. They handle those higher ISO values really quite well. So I feel comfortable shooting certainly 3200, 4000, 6400. Above that, I, I just don't like to shoot above that. And I think that probably, I mean, some of these cameras are absolutely fine above that, but it just feels wrong. So at that point, I like to think about, okay, how can I light this in a different way? Or how can I use the existing light differently? Or, or can I move myself to change how I can expose this? But it is often a balancing act between that aperture, the depth of field, and then the shutter speed, while trying to minimize how much you're having to push that ISO. A couple of other tricks that I use sometimes if the light just isn't working for me. One is that I'll get low and I'll try and backlight my subject. This bee photo, for example, at least I think it's a bee. I'm not gonna lie to you. I'm not an expert on insects, but this bee, maybe, photo is backlit because I couldn't get the right exposure without using some ridiculous ISO. So I just got low so that I could have the sky in the background and essentially I can then silhouette my subject. That makes it a lot easier to expose and I don't have to bump up that ISO to some crazy level. It also looks quite interesting and it's a different kind of photo for this kind of photography. I was able to use a faster shutter speed because it was a fast moving subject and stop down that aperture a decent amount to get a reasonably deep depth of field. So those are some tips to get you started with macro wildlife but we've really just scratched the surface. There's loads of stuff we haven't talked about, loads of stuff, actually. So I'd love to hear any tips that you might have, of course. I'd love to hear if you do things differently as well, different to how we've explained it here. I would love to hear all of that stuff down in the comments. You have incredibly insightful comments, and I think we have a great community here, so I would love to hear all of your thoughts. Of course, 
There's a full list of all the kit used for these photos and this video as well down in the description of this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe as well. I will see you in the next video. But until then, as always, thanks for watching. Bye.